Our third and final case study of a tribal society is the Yanomami of South America. Like the Newer and Trobrianders, these people are famous due to the lifelong fieldwork of a single influential anthropologist, Napoleon Shagnon, who has conducted research among the Yanomami since the early 1960s. There are about 26,000 Yanomami, who are also sometimes referred to as Yanomamo. There are tribal people living in the dense tropical rainforests of South America, along and around the upper Orinoco River Basin. This river originates in the mountainous region along the border between Brazil and Venezuela, and then flows north and east through Venezuela to empty into the Gulf of Mexico. Most Yanomami live in Venezuela, but some of their territory lies across the border in Brazil as well. The environment and climate is much what one might expect for a tropical rainforest. Temperatures are hot and humid year round with copious rain. The land is covered by very dense vegetation, most of which unfortunately has little practical use for humans, but there is ample animal life in the forests and rivers. Like many tribal societies, the Yanomami are horticulturalists. They get most of their food by growing small, multi-crop garden plots adjacent to their settlements. These crops include plantain, a relative of bananas, and manioc, taro, and sweet potatoes. These root crops grow well in the poor forest soils and shady plots, whereas grain like corn or wheat would fail. Farmed crops make up about 80% of the Yanomami diet, supplemented by wild fruits and nuts when they're in season. All protein comes from wild game and fishing. The Yanomami do not keep any domesticated animals. To grow their gardens, the Yanomami use a technique quite common to horticulturalists in tropical forests around the world. This is called slash and burn, where a section of forest is cut down, burned, and the ashy soil is used for crops. This is necessary to get any useful harvest from the poor soils. After all, when we look at a tropical forest, we see a vibrant, lush, green landscape and assume the soil must be extremely fertile. But it's precisely because the landscape is so green and lush that the forest soils are quite nutrient poor. All the nutrients that once were in the soil have been taken up into the trees and undergrowth and aren't available anymore for new crops. The burning turns that undergrowth into ash and the ash returns all the nutrients to the soil and makes it available to the growing crops. However, as the crops grow and are removed, they take the nutrients with them. Of course, that's the point, to ultimately transfer those nutrients to people. But in slash and burn horticulture, there's no way to replenish the nutrients in the soil other than more burning. So over a period of a few years, the fertility of the plot becomes exhausted. When that happens, the only thing to do is move to a new plot and slash and burn a new garden spot. This is a major investment of energy on the part of the farmers, but it only needs to be done once every few years. Once the old plot has regone its natural forest cover, trees, bushes, and so on, for several years, it can be re-cleared and burned again. But it may take several decades to return to full productivity, depending on what species of plants grow in the immediate vicinity. More costly than clearing the gardens may be the transport costs. As plots near the village become exhausted, people must move their gardens farther and farther away. The farther away from the village, the more travel is involved. At harvest time, the whole harvest must be carried back to the distant village. During all that travel time, you're exposing yourself to the dangerous forests, to predators, to accidents, and to enemies. So in many parts of the world, maybe once a generation or so, the travel involved in horticulture gets to be more trouble than it's worth. The whole village is moved to be closer to the currently productive plots. We saw the same pattern with newer horticulture, though they do not rely on slash and burn. That discussion of Yanomami horticulture, though, transitions us nicely to the topic of their settlement patterns. Like most tribal societies, the Yanomami are sedentary, living in settled, more or less permanent villages. The 26,000 Yanomami are spread over about 250 total villages. Each village has between 40 and 300 residents. These villages, as we said, move to new locations en masse every couple decades, 
but they tend not to move too far, staying in the same part of Yanomami territory that is known to the inhabitants. The unique thing about a Yanomami village, called a Shabono, is that from outside it looks like a single structure. Each Yanomami household is responsible for building its own house, usually a small square structure of posts with open walls. These are set up around a cleared, open public space. There's no wall facing the plaza, and only minimal screens separating individual houses. The whole ring of houses is covered in a single communal thatch roof, and a single communal entrance, really just a break in the ring of homes, allows entrance to the village. This structure reinforces the communal egalitarian nature of Yanomami village life, with everyone's house looking in on everyone else's, and their backs literally turned to the outside world. Unfortunately, in the tropical environment, the wooden poles and thatch decay quickly. The entire structure needs to be rebuilt every few years, but that provides another excuse to build community solidarity through cooperation. Yanomami kinship is reckoned patrilineally. Children belong to the clans of their fathers, and clans are exogamous so that husbands and wives belong to different groups. Residence is patrilocal. A new bride will leave her village and take up residence with her husband. This means that Yanomami villages are comprised of many closely related men, their genetically unrelated wives, and their children. Such organization is probably a response to the endemic warfare among Yanomami villages. In a smaller community such as the Yanomamis, closely related men are likely to fight on the same side in any conflict, so keeping them near one another allows for allies to rally to one another's aid quickly. Meanwhile, the fact that one's sisters are dispersed among nearby villages serves to give a man pause before starting a conflict with the neighbors. The prevalence of warfare is also probably behind another famous dimension of Yanomami daily life, their marked gender stratification. While, like all tribal societies, the Yanomami are egalitarian in general, this does not extend to relationships between the genders. Yanomami men are clearly considered superior to women in every respect, and they're encouraged to express this superiority through frequent minor acts of violence against their wives. In a setting where warfare is constant, aggression is encouraged among male warriors, but must be directed outward, away from the local clans. Wives, who belong to different clans from their husbands, serve as convenient outsiders. Marriages are frequently arranged between young girls and much older men in nearby villages, often for the express purpose of resolving past hostilities. But this puts young, defenseless girls at the mercy of men who, just prior, were enemies. Young wives can thus be subjected to violent treatment by their husbands. It's generally the responsibility of the girls' brothers to protect them from unacceptably abusive husbands, but they may be in distant villages and unaware of the problems. On the other hand, older women who have lived in their husbands' villages for years or decades, and who've raised children who belong to the local clans, enjoy a remarkable degree of freedom and respect. They're generally quite safe in both their brothers' and their husbands' villages, even during conflicts. In this way, they might also serve as peacekeepers. This brings us to considering the political organization of the Yanomami, both within and between villages. As we've mentioned several times already, the Yanomami are organized according to tribal principles, which means egalitarianism. Each village is politically autonomous. Within each village, all men are considered equal. Decisions are made through consensus and only after extensive debate. Each village has a headman who nominally coordinates group activities, especially when dealing with outsiders. But this man has no real authority of his own. He can only represent the group will and relay outsiders' requests to the rest of his community. Usually, the most important job of the headman is to plan and lead the elaborate feasts that his village will host when seeking to establish or maintain alliances with other villages. The host village, often at the urging of the headman, will invite a neighboring village's whole population to feast, arrange marriage exchanges, and trade. These peaceful interactions are essential to building ties between the villages that will later discourage violence when tempers inevitably flare. 
So important are these trading alliances and feasts that the Yanomami invent excuses to trade for items that they could easily manufacture for themselves. Yanomami religion is complex and multifaceted. Generally, it involves the careful maintenance of relationships with a variety of kinds of spirits, or in anthropological parlance, other than human persons. Each class of spirit has special powers, personality traits, and associated rituals. The only religious specialist in Yanomami religion is a shaman. Remember that a shaman is someone specially trained in magical or religious ceremonies and who performs those rituals on behalf of others. But shaman are only part-time specialists and are still responsible for their own subsistence and basic economic needs. The part-time nature of a shaman's job is a good fit for the egalitarian structure of tribes, where anyone who wishes to undergo shaman training can do so. Among the Yanomami, shaman are primarily healers of supernatural ailments whose services are only needed sporadically. While they may be respected and given deference in village debates, shaman are not typically community leaders in non-religious contexts. Yanomami tradition allows anyone who wishes to train as a shaman to do so, but the training is difficult and often painful. Shaman must learn to attract to their bodies the hikura, ancestral spirits from early in the history of the world. When the Hikura spirits have possessed a shaman's body, he can access their power to heal by taking hallucinogens. These substances, called yopo and yakoana, are prepared from local plants and snorted through the nose to produce their psychoactive effects. Another person will blow the powder through a long tube into the nose of the shaman as part of the ritual. After entering the trance state, the shaman is able to draw on the power of his Hikura spirits to cure whatever supernatural ailment is afflicting the patient. Yopo is addictive and is taken recreationally by many Yanomami men, not just during ceremonies. Only trained shaman can effectively access the drug's supposed spiritual properties, however. Death among the Yanomami is as difficult as it is among any community. The Yanomami, however, have a particularly complex view of death due to the complexity of their beliefs about the human soul. They believe each person has four distinct souls, the combination of which creates his or her unique personality. One soul is the one that will eventually separate from the body and travel to the world of the afterlife in the sky. A second soul will leave the body at death and travel to the forest, where it can attack those guilty of various crimes and misbehavior. A third soul can be attacked during a person's lifetime by malicious spirits or enemy sorcerers and is the cause of most illnesses. And finally, a fourth spirit takes the form of an animal that lives a parallel life in the forest. When a person dies, his animal spirit also dies and vice versa. Balancing these different spirits and ensuring that all of them transition to the appropriate spirit worlds is the focus of Yanomami funerals. One of the most important parts of these rites is the total destruction of the body. No bit can remain, even buried in the soil. For this reason, Yanomami practice cremation under most circumstances. Following the cremation, even the ashes are eventually destroyed. They're mixed bit by bit into teas and soups and consumed by the deceased's relatives. This is thought to return the vital stuff of the clan back to its surviving members and also to ensure that the spirit of the deceased is released properly to the next life. Let's look briefly at the role that the Yanomami have played in anthropology in recent decades. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, the anthropologist most closely associated with the Yanomami is Napoleon Chagnon, an American scholar who first traveled to Venezuela in the early 1960s. In 1968, he published an ethnography of the Yanomami titled Yanomamo, the Fierce People, in which he argued that violence was a persistent and defining aspect of Yanomami life. It was a landmark study of the roles that violence can play in human societies. However, not long after its publication, other anthropologists challenged Chagnon's interpretations, arguing that he'd exaggerated the prevalence of violence in Yanomami life to support his own theories. These included some rather controversial ideas that humans are, in part, genetically predisposed to violence. These other anthropologists, several of whom are quoted in your textbook, so I won't go into detail, 
argued that violence was a part of Yanomami life, but no more so than in any other tribal society. The debate simmered for several decades, but finally erupted in 2000 when a writer named Patrick Tierney published Darkness in El Dorado, in which he accused Shagnon and his associates of a variety of ethical abuses and faulty research. The American Anthropological Association, the largest professional organization of anthropologists in the U.S., immediately launched a thorough examination of Shagnon's research. Much of what they found vindicated Shagnon and his partners. Tierney's book was found to be sloppily researched, misleading at best, and deliberately fraudulent at worst. But Shagnon himself was found to have sometimes put his own theories and publicity before the best interests of the Yanomami. He was censured for these lapses. But the AAA is not a licensing body, so he remains active in the field today. Finally, let's consider the changes that have come to the Yanomami's life since Shagnon first lived with them more than 50 years ago. The truth is, those changes are remarkably few. Thanks to their remote homeland, the Yanomami have had relatively little contact with the outside world. Their daily lives today are largely unchanged from centuries ago. The biggest changes that have occurred, though, began in the 1980s with the discovery of gold deposits in their mountain homeland in Brazil. Owing to the remote location and relative ineffectiveness of the Brazilian government, rogue mining companies flooded into the region, sparking widespread conflict with the natives. This not only killed many Yanomami through outright hostility with the much better armed miners, but also introduced foreign diseases to which the Yanomami had no natural resistance. Thousands have died, and it's only in the past few years that national governments have curtailed illegal businesses in native territory. Meanwhile, these conflicts with outsiders have led the Yanomami to band together in ways seldom seen in the past. While each village remains politically autonomous, they are now more likely to ally with one another to present a unified resistance. Representatives have increasingly traveled from their homes to the national capitals of Brazil and Venezuela to plead their cases, and some have addressed international bodies like the UN as well. Hostilities among Yanomami villages are correspondingly down. This argues against Shagnon's depiction of them as inherently hostile people. The more important lessons we learn from studying the Yanomami may lie in what we learn about ourselves. Their culture is one that, to outsiders at least, seems remarkably violent and dangerous. It's tempting to see them as Shagnon did originally as the fierce people. But we would be incorrect to simply dismiss them as violent brutes. Their lives are also remarkably rich, both socially and spiritually. Like everyone else, they're complex humans making a living in a complex world.